Hello folks, this is your boy Nathan in the booth of truth. And uh, yeah, we're in the book Revolt Against Maturity, doing it chapter by chapter. And we're in a bit of a longer chapter, eight pages, the, the resurrection body, chapter 45. So the Revolt Against Maturity by R.J. Rushdie, The Biblical Psychology of Man, chapter 45. Audible heading your way. Let's go and hit record this time with the big record. Forty five. The resurrection body. As we have seen, the pagan concepts of life after death are of an afterlife, pale, shadowy, and essentially meaningless. Platonism had a theory of survival in which that which survives death was mainly the power of abstract thought, contemplation for eternity and the abstract ideas of Plato. For Aristotle, pure intellect alone survived to be absorbed into the divine mind. Homer's ideas reflect a more popular opinion. In Homer, the dead are shades, pale, bloodless ghosts who have no joy, and are barely alive. Odysseus, in Homer's Odyssey, Book 11, is able to communicate with the dead by sacrificing animals and allowing the shades to drink the blood, which gives them temporary vitality and revives their memory and strengthens their speech. Anon came to the soul of Theban Tereusias with a golden scepter in his hand, and he knew me and speak unto me. Son of Laertes, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus, of many devices, what seekest thou now, wretched man? Wherefore hast thou left the sunlight, and come hither to behold the dead, and a land of desolate joy? Oh yes, desolate joy, that's my favourite. Oh, desolate joy, I just love it. Yes! Oh, what awful narration. Ah. Uh. Ah, oh, I just can't bear it. No, it's unbearably bad. Unbearably awful. I just, I, you know, I have limits. Come on now, please. Son of Laertes, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, what seekest thou now, wretched man? Wherefore hast thou left the sunlight and come hither to behold the dead in a land desolate of joy? Nay, hold off the ditch, and draw back thy sharp sword, that I may drink of the blood, and tell thee sooth. Butcher and Lang Translation This fact makes clear how easily the Greek tradition received the apparently Slavonic tradition of vampirism, and incorporated it into Greek beliefs. The thirst of the dead for blood as a means for temporary revitalization had a meaning to ancient Greece. In both Slavonic and Greek traditions, the vampire directs his violence, first and foremost, against the nearest. His violence, first and foremost, against his nearest of kin. The essential pessimism of non Christian cultures leads them to assume either a stagnant state. Oh, la, 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 la. Lead them. Don't guess, Nathan. The essential pessimism of non-Christian cultures led them to assume either a stagnant state of ostensible bliss, sexual in the case of Mohammedism, and sterile or... And st oh, come on. Don't be giving me chip here. Ah, come on now. Gonna assume the kneeling position. Yes, sure, the boom, boom, boom. And sterile, or to regard the future as an afterlife, 
a pale relic of life. In the case of Islam and other views of future bliss, the essence of the life to come is a selected series of pleasures transferred from this life so that it still remains an afterlife. It is essentially a belief in man's retirement from the life of this world to enjoy eating, drinking, copulating and other like pleasures. Thus, the favourable views of the afterlife are basically pathetic dreams of catching up on lost or dreamed of pleasures. There is no hint in these views of the biblical vision of a new life, new in nature and quality, and a movement in work in terms of it. The Stoic view of immortality was clear in its pessimism, whether or not it was believed that men had any personal life or memory in the afterlife, the Stoic did believe in a periodic destruction and reconstruction of all things. This was a logical conclusion from the cyclical view of history and time. I just forgot to unpause the video. In sharp contrast to all pagan views is the biblical doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 39-50 not only declares the resurrection of the body, but a new and perfect dimension of life. Instead of being an afterlife, it is the true life and it bears a relationship to this life as a plant does to its seed. It is flesh, but not the same flesh just as differences exist between men, fish, birds and beasts, so there are marked differences between celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. 1 Corinthians 15, 39-42 The body is sown in dishonour and weakness, that is, burial, and the fact of death dishonours the body and indicates its basic vulnerability. It is, however, raised in glory and power, as Hodge noted, the future body will be instinct. Will be instinct. This what? What does that mean? Ah. The future body will be instinct with energy, endowed, it may be, with faculties of which we have now no conception. It is a spiritual body which does not mean ethereal, refined, much less made of spirit, which would be a contradiction, nor does it mean animated by the Holy Spirit. Calvin, however, declares that this is exactly what it means. Now that is called animal, which is quickened by anima, the soul, that is spiritual, which is quickened by the spirit, just as we have a body adapted to our life now, so shall then, so shall, so we shall then, look. Adapted to our life now, so we shall then have a body adapted to our new estate and nature. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. This is the meaning of scripture, St. Paul tells us. Christ comes as the last Adam, a quickening spirit. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul, a creature endowed with animal life, whereas Christ has life in himself and can give life to as many as he will. John 5, 21 and 26. Then St. Paul declares, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. 1 Corinthians fifteen forty six. Hodge commented thus, This does not mean simply that the natural body precedes the spiritual body, but it announces, as it were, a general law. The lower precedes the higher. The imperfect, the perfect. This is true in all the works of God in which there is a development. Adam's earthly state was to be preparatory to the law.
Adam's earthly state was to be preparatory to a heavenly one. The present life is like a seed time. The harvest is hereafter. The natural comes before the spiritual, as Calvin says. We are born before we are regenerated. We live before we rise. Having been first born of Adam, we have Adam's earthly body. Being now born of Christ, we shall have a body fashioned like his own glorious and immortal body. Philippians 3.21 1 Corinthians 15.48 As we have borne the image of Adam as to his body, we shall bear the image of Christ as to his body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. 1 Corinthians 15.50 Flesh and blood, that is, our bodies as now constituted, cannot inherit the kingdom, nor the mortal be immortal. A new body is required for that. This great change affects more than man. Abraham Kuyper. Abraham. I'm going to do the Abraham Kuyper thing again because, yeah, you know. Kuyper. Abraham Kuyper. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham Kuyper, Abraham Kuyper. Abraham Kuyper believed that the new creation included the animals, a belief which Peters regarded as speculation. Calvin, however, held the same view of the resurrection of the animal creation as a result of his exegesis of Romans 8.21, and he commented, it is then indeed meet for us to consider what a dreadful curse we have deserved, since all created things in themselves blameless, both on earth and in the visible heaven, undergo punishment for our sins. For it has not happened through their own fault that they are liable to corruption. Thus the condemnation of mankind is imprinted on the heavens and on the earth and on all creatures. It hence also appears to what excelling glory the sons of God shall be exalted, for all creatures shall be renewed in order to amplify it and to render it illustrious. But he means not that all creatures shall be partakers of the same glory with the sons of God, but that they, according to their nature, shall be participators of a better condition, for God will restore to a perfect state of the world, now fallen, together with mankind, but what that perfection will be as to beasts as well as plants and metals is not meet nor right in us to inquire more cur You heard it first. Boop. Plants and metals is not meet nor right in us to inquire more curiously, for the chief effect of corruption is decay. Some subtle men, but hardly sober-minded, inquire whether all kinds of animals will be immortal. But, if brains be given to speculations, where will they at length lead us? Let us then be content with this simple doctrine, that such will be the constitution and the complete order of things, that nothing will be deformed or fading. The word resurrection, anastasis, means a raising up to cause to stand up, and implies an exaltation and an advance or victory. The general resurrection and the new creation is thus the victorious standing up or raising up of all creation. The creation comes into its own according to God's sovereign purpose. Thus, however transmuted the physical universe and our bodies may be, they are still resurrected and are not destroyed but rather brought to their ordained purpose. The doctrine of the resurrection is inseparable from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Egyptians, who seemed to approximate a belief in bodily resurrection, actually held to a divinization of man. This concept, though totally wrong, had at least the shrewd insight that any kind of bodily life in the future involved some kind of divine miracle. Therefore, it meant that 
man had become a god. This belief is, for biblical thinking, simply part of man's original sin to be as God. Genesis 3, 5, and is impossible. Created being is forever and only created being. And the uncreated being of God is forever and only God. In Jesus Christ, the last Adam, there is a perfect union without confusion, as Chalcedon declared, of the two natures, so that Jesus Christ was very God of very God and very man of very man. The incarnation is unique and without any mingling of the natures, but rather a perfect union without confusion. As the last Adam, Jesus Christ is the perfect man and the fountainhead of a new humanity which is born again through his sovereign grace and power. The purpose of history is revealed in him, the greater Adam, so that we must say, the meaning of history has its ground, not in history, but in Christ. Not only the meaning, but also the determination of history are from beyond history. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Acts 15, 18. This means, moreover, that the resurrection of Jesus is an anticipation of the new world of God. This endows the resurrection of Jesus with the character of a turning point in the ages in such a way that the old aeon, I look like acorn missing an hour. In such a way that... Jesus with the character of a in such a way that the old aeon is still present as the new aeon begins. Thus, two worlds are now in existence and conflict. The old world seems at times to be the stronger in that sin and death beset every man, and the universe feels a helplessness and futility in the face of its decay and death. The seeming power of the old world 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 the seeming power of the old world is in reality the judgment of god upon it the stronger the old order seems to become the nearer to self-destruction it is the powers of darkness have god's judgment written into their every fiber and in their every pretension and move okay i see Right. Into their every fibre, and in their every pretension and move, they set forth God's judgment upon themselves. Over against the sovereignty of the power of darkness, the prince of death, the demonic forces in the old world epoch, there stands in the resurrection aeon the prince of life, the sovereignty of the Kyrios, the victory in principle over all that destroys life. Christ, by his resurrection, destroyed the power of sin and of death. By his ascension, his glorified humanity entered into a new condition of existence in heaven, where he reigns as sovereign and intercedes with God the Father for his people. St. Paul declared, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. Romans 11.16 He applied this principle to draw the logical implication. Now hath Christ been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of them that are asleep. 1 Corinthians 15.21 His destiny is made the destiny of his redeemed humanity, his people. Those who are Christ's are those who acknowledge his lordship stand in his atoning grace and submit to his law word. God's being is marked by aseity, that is, he is self-derived and his being is entirely of himself. God is eternally and forever himself. I thought that was a comma, it was the uh, cursor. God is eternally and forever himself uncreated, wholly omnipotent and omniscient, 
and owing nothing to any creature he... Blah. And owing nothing to any creature, he declares, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 22. As against this, the ungodly affirm their own ascetic, and hell is the realm of those who, in eternal isolation, affirm their independence from God and man. Duffy has said of the writer Jack Kerouac, For if a philosophical point may be made about a largely unphilosophical movement, the beef generation may be said to have all its character compressed into the radical aseity of the formula, I am that I am. The existentialist in modern world is dedicated to belief in the aseity of man. As a result, the existentialist mentality, where articulate, as in writers, is marked by a frantic religiosity without God, the sense of the holiness of violence. Uh, try again. The sense of the holiness of violence. It offers violence and death as the new revelation and as the only possible goal of history. It seeks to become Christ in a Christless world and to take over and destroy all that has come before. Existentialism leads man to a demonic quest, to the demonic desire to prove that he is beyond any form of divine mandate that he is his own God, to be the source of his own fate. Satan has once again become the modern hero, hell the modern scene. There's a bit of a bash there. Yet, it... Blah. No, that was grand. Yet, it is a bad faith which follows from the tenets of existentialism itself. Existential choice and freedom are constructed along asocial lines. Existential commitment, on the other hand, is a principle of social involvement. The hero is thus torn between the instinct to live outside society and the guilt which follows such a choice. These two positions are mutually exclusive, and yet to see them both in existential philosophy it's only to place Sartre's no exit next to his what is literature? Destruction. Either death or a kind of insanity is at the end of the existential quest. And yet the quest, the dramatic means of revealing a free will in search of identity. In search of identity. Misprint. Identity is absolutely necessary to existential literature. The existential hero believes at times that hell is other people. He also believes that there is no longer a dichotomy between good and evil, and that evil is a gratuity, a latent part of existence. The culmination of this demonic urge for aseity is hell and the eternal isolation of the reprobate. There is no community in hell. Every man there is his own universe, insistent that the only real world is a world of his own. Is the world of his own imagination. The culmination of redemption is the resurrection of the body, life in the new creation, the perfect community of God and the fullness of self-realization in God's service eternally. Whew. Well, thanks for tuning in, folks. That was nice to have you. Uh, that was chapter 45, um, The Resurrection Body. And that was R.J. Rushdoonies. 
Revolt Against Maturity, the Biblical for the Psychology of Man. Hope you enjoyed that. The project, is, uh, the aim of the project is to uh, get all Rashtuni's work out on Audible and other audiobook platforms. So if you're interested in that, um, in supporting that work, you can go, you can like, share, comment, message me, all that good stuff. Thank you for those who've done so. Or you can go to nathanteacher.com forward slash donations. Either way, thank you very much for persevering. And I hope to see you in the next chapter, chapter 46. <laughs>